Today let's talk about ionic compounds. So the most common example of uh, an ionic compound would be table salt. And it's kind of surprising with table salt. It's composed of sodium, which turns out to be a metal. And you have to store that metal in an oil. If you take the metal out and say put it in water, then it burns. It's a fairly violent reaction. Chlorine here, it turns out to be a gas. In fact, it's, it's a poisonous gas. But when you mix the two in an ionic compound, you get ordinary table salt, which is safe. How do we get ionic compounds? Well, they occur whenever metals and nonmetals react together. And what is it that holds an ionic compound together? Well, let's go back to our sodium chloride example. Here's sodium. It's got, it's a metal, and it has one extra electron in the outer shell. Whereas chlorine, the non-metal, has seven electrons in the outer shell. And so, of course, chlorine is grabby for electrons. It needs an electron to complete its outer shell. Whereas sodium is very likely to give away its outer shell. So let's assume that chlorine gives away its outer shell electron. It loses that outer orbit. Then, of course, it's chlorine that's going to grab that extra electron. So that extra electron is going to come over here. And what that means is that this chlorine will become negatively charged. Whereas the sodium here, it becomes positively charged. And of course, when a negative and a positive are close together, they attract each other. And it's that attraction between positive and negative, between the positive ion and the negative ion, that forms the bond and holds the two ions together important to realize that in any ionic compound, and this ionic compound here is supposed to be sodium chloride, so the sodium are the positive charges and the chlorines are the negative charges, but the thing is we might think, oh well, right here, positive, negative, that would be a sodium chloride molecule, but that molecule isn't any different from this molecule. It's also a chlorine and a sodium. So there really aren't any individual molecule within an ionic compound. It's just a big network of positive and negative ions all joined together. How do we name these ionic compounds? Well, table salt, its chemical name, its proper name is sodium chloride. And this really tells us the rule that we use for naming an ionic compound. The first thing you do is the metal. So it's always the metal that you write first. Then here the non-metal is chlorine. But you notice we've changed the ending. So we write the non-metal with an IDE ending. Let's see if we can practice that with a few examples. Pause the video now and see if you can write down the proper names for the following combinations of metals and nonmetals. Okay, so hopefully you said potassium is, hopefully you said potassium and bromine would be, write the metal first, that's the potassium, and then write the nonmetal, but put an IDE ending. Calcium and oxygen, calcium is the metal. So it's going to be calcium, not oxygen, but oxide. And nitrogen and magnesium, well, it's magnesium. Check on your periodic table. The metal is magnesium, and nitrogen will become nitride. So it's magnesium nitride. We would also like to be able to write chemical formulas in symbolic form for these different ionic compounds. So what we're going to do is practice on exam an example. We're going to use magnesium nitride. And we're going to follow a series of steps to write down the chemical formula. 
So the first thing is write the symbols for each ion with their charge number. So magnesium, look that up on the periodic table. It's in the second column. It'll be magnesium plus two. And then nitrogen, it's a non-metal. It will be a minus three. That's its ionic charge number. That's step one. Okay, step two. Cross over the ionic charge numbers. So we had Mg plus 2 N minus 3. What we want to do now is cross those over. So bring that negative 3 down here and bring that plus 2 over here. So what we're going to end up with would be Mg. I'll leave the plus 2 and the minus 3 for now. But we cross over. So this becomes, on the bottom, a minus 3 and a plus 2. Next thing it tells us to do, and eventually we're going to combine step 2 and step 3 into just one step, it says remove the ionic charge numbers, which means, so let's write down what we had before. We have this mg plus 2 n minus 3. We've written down the minus 3 and the plus 2. What we do now is we get rid of the, I the ionic charge numbers. We get rid of that and that. And remove any plus or minus sign from the subscripts. So we're going to remove that minus sign and that plus sign. And what we end up with as a final answer will be Mg3 N2. Actually, in this case, it's the final answer, but there is actually another step. In this case, we're already reduced to lowest form. So we said it was Mg3 N2. There is no integer that divides evenly into both 3 and 2 aside from the number 1. So that's already in lowest terms. But if we had had something like mg4 and n2, then 2 would divide evenly into 4, and 2 would divide evenly into 2. So we'd reduce this to lowest terms, like that. And typically, we don't write the 1. We would just write it as mg2n. What this means is that in our lattice, there's going to be 3 magnesium ions for every 2 nitrogen ions. Okay, Let's see if we can do that. So maybe stop the video now, try these three questions, and then I'll take them up. That's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.